Yeah, good morning. Uh, thankful to the three people who have, you know, got up in the morning. So early bird catches the worm, so you will get to know the tips. The topic is big bubble versus manual dark, no financial interest. The biggest advantage of doing a dark is that you preserve the host endothelium, thereby you reduce the risk of endothelial rejection. So the long-term survival of the graft is far better. Basically, uh, two type of techniques we do. One where we expose the pre-decimates layer. Earlier we used to think that that's the decimates membrane. And you do a manual dissection to reach the near decimates level within 100 microns of it. Uh, you can inject air or viscoelastic in the stroma to create that plane of separation. And preoperatively, I think the two most important uh, investigation that you should know is one, the regional pachymetry. What's the thickness across the cornea? So you can decide what size of trifying you're going to use, especially in ectatic disorders. And you do a corneal anterior segment OCT in which you can see whether the pathology is involving the decimates layer or it's located in the anterior 80 to 90%. If the decimates membrane is not involved, then you can think about doing a big bubble technique or otherwise you have to go for the manual technique. Uh, Professor Dua described the pre-decimates layer or the Dua's layer, uh, which is basically uh, a surgical layer where when we inject air into the stroma, you get a type 1 bubble, which is a separation between the stroma and the pre-decimates layer. The bubble starts in the center, goes to the periphery. A type 2 bubble is actually a separation between the pre-decimates layer and the decimates membrane. It, it can... Uh, it, it doesn't have a dense white margin, it is a very sharp margin and it can start from the periphery and go across the entire cornea. And you get to get a mix of the type 1 and type 2 as well, which starts with a type 1 and then breaks into a type 2. Among the indications, yes, you can do it for anything where the, any condition where the endothelium is healthy. Commonly, we do it for ectatic disorders or corneal scars and dystrophies. If you have macular dystrophy, very advanced keratoconus, extreme thinning and scars involving the decimates, you would prefer to do a manual dark. Also a failed big bubble or you get an abnormal response to the air injection, sometimes you have microperforation during the surgery, then you can also convert to a manual dark technique. So it's important that you learn both the techniques and be familiar with that. For either of the technique, a partial thickness trephination is essential. Commonly we use the Hesburgh pattern suction trephine where a quarter turn of the trifine cuts down a depth of 60 microns. You have these guarded depth trifines of 300, 350, or 400 micron blades, where manually you can trifine and reach up to that depth. You can do that with a femtosecond laser, or in certain cases, you can even use a preset diamond knife set to the desired depth and achieve that trifination. For a manual technique, uh, we basically, uh, after trifination, we debulk the anterior half of the cornea. The other video is of a failed big bubble. Uh, so you make this peripheral pocket at the base of the trifination at about 85-90% depth. And then the pocket is carried along the edge of the trifination. So it's basically creating a stromal pocket both clockwise and anticlockwise. Uh, and this is ideally at a depth of about 85-90 microns. And then you can start peeling off the stroma. So the, basically this technique is a modified Malbrans peeling technique. If you, if you feel that by applying the pressure you are able to peel relatively easily, then you know that you are very close to the decimus membrane because the stromal fibers are much more loosely attached in the posterior half of the cornea. That's some of the clinical cases, a case of hydrox with a posterior scar where uh, manual dalk has been performed. You can see that the residual bed is only about 30 microns. If you can switch off those lights, we can, I can talk better and maybe they can see the slides better. This is another case where a manual dalk is performed and you can see that the outcome looks pretty good. If you have access to intraop OCT in real time, you can see the amount of residual uh, stroma that's left behind and that's pretty useful, uh, especially when you are performing a manual dalk surgery. This is a nice paper from Paolo Rama back in 2013 where in a large series of 288 eyes, they performed a manual dalk in all their cases. And, if, and the rate of perforation was pretty low, only about 4.2%. Induced astigmatism was also low, especially in uh, lamellar keratoplasty because you're not opening up the anterior chamber. The amount of induced astigmatism is usually less. And the majority of the patient had about 20, 40 or better. 
For a big bubble dial, uh, we do the trephination. I like to debulk the anterior half of the cornea. And then we uh, go ahead with the cannula, which is placed at about 80-85% depth. You inject air and you get this whitening of the cornea and this appearance of the big bubble, which is uh, has a dense white frothy margin, starts from the center and expands to the periphery to a diameter of about 88.5. You'll feel an initial resistance, then a giveaway sensation, and then as the bubble expands, the resistance builds up again. I like to do a, a sequential air injection where the initial air injection is performed, following which if you don't do a paracent, if you don't release the pressure, the aqueous doesn't get displaced and you can have a rupture of the, uh, the type 1 bubble. So instead of that, we initiate the bubble and then we do a paracentesis to release the aqueous so the counter pressure is minimized and then you go ahead and expand the bubble to the desired thickness. Uh, you get the big bubble identified by putting a small air bubble or you interop OCT, you can see directly the big bubble or you can see that the periphery becomes soft after releasing fluid from the paracentesis but the center part where there is a bubble, it will remain firm. To deflate, you can put some viscoelastic on the cornea and then you can use a knife to just go ahead and release the air. The presence of viscoelastic retards the egress of air thereby you get a gradual collapse of the big bubble and not a sudden uh, collapse. You can excise the residual stroma uh, by dividing into segments. But remember, if there are peripheral additions, re release them. If you don't do that, when you're excising the stroma, you can end up with a perforation as well. The donor, donor diameter can be the same size for ectatic disorders. And if you're doing it for other indications, I usually oversize by 0.25. Postoperatively, uh, you don't need to use steroids pretty long. You can use it for the first six weeks and then move on to softer steroids. The endothelial cell uh, is, uh, counts are preserved, so definitely uh, the risk of rejection is much lower. Femtosecond laser gives you the shaped incision, so the induced astigmatism while the sutures are there is much less. But sometimes when you remove sutures, you can still have unpredictable astigmatism even in these eyes. These kind of scenarios where this is a perforated ulcer where glue and amniotic membrane has been done, it was referred for a corneal transplant, we went ahead and decided to do a, obviously you can't do a big bubble technique in this case, so we decided to do a manual dial, starting from the opposite end, and then you do your manual dissection after reaching 85 to 90 percent of the depth. And as you reach the last part, the perforation, you have to do a little bit of sharp dissection as well. And you can see that's how it looks in the immediate post-op, and at one month you can see that the cornea looks pretty clear with good cell count, about 2,800 is a young patient and a corrected vision of 2030. Postoperatively, both the big bubble or the manual dalk, if you have a perforation, there's always a risk of double anterior chamber. So uh, surgically, intraoperatively, you can make a small inferior PI and then do a complete air fill. Or if you see this postoperatively, you can go ahead and do a rebubbling. Remember to keep the pupil dilated to prevent a pupillary block, and that's very important. So this is a flow chart just to show you the decision making for the DALC surgery, whether you do a big bubble or a manual DALC. So it depends on the scars, whether they are involving the decimus or the pre-decimus layer, and the response to the air injection, whether you achieve a bubble or you don't achieve. So then you can go ahead and do a manual DALC. So in conclusion, DALC should be considered as a procedure of choice for corneal disorders with healthy endothelium. The pre-op evaluation and surgical planning is essential to perform either a big bubble dalk or a manual dalk and minimize the intra-op complications. So if you go ahead and try to do a big bubble dalk in every case, uh, you are more likely to encounter uh, uh, abnormal responses to the air injection. And the bearing of the pre-decimus layer is not essential for a, a successful dalk, but try to go as near decimus as possible. But to re uh, the other thing is to leave behind a very smooth interface and not an irregular interface. You may have to fashion your corneal graphs depending on the size of the bed that you have. If you're doing a manual dalk and you have a bed of 100 microns, don't put a full thickness graft. You can always go ahead, prepare a 400 micron graft, and then put it in place. And in future, the femtosecond laser technology and the intraop OCT definitely will help improve further outcomes. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. <laughs> thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk, wonderful CPs, and those videos. Uh, I just want to ask one thing. Recently, I did a dalk and I got a type 1 bubble and multiple pockets of type 2 bubble 
so uh, what i did is i went out with uh, dive one bubble and left those small bubbles expecting that they will resolve in post op but for next till one week those bubbles were still persisting have you ever encountered such yes, situation yes that's sometimes we get these mixed bubbles where it starts as a type 1 and you also get a type 2 as well if the type 2 bubble is very small if you just leave it it will spontaneously absorb otherwise if there is a large bubble i'm more worried about the endothelium touching the continuously being in contact with the iris so in that scenario i will open up the type 1 bubble complete my rest of the surgery using manual dissection but before i put in my graft maybe i'll use a knife and just make a small nick to release the air from the type 2 bubble and then i can put in my graft thank you sir any questions Have you noticed any difference in outcome between type one and type two bubble in terms of visual acuity? No, type two bubble. If you try to expose it, which we have done sometimes in macular dystrophy, normally yeah, when correct. you do that, you do get the type two bubble quite frequently. Mm -hmm. But the problem with type two bubble is, unlike the pre-decimus layer, which is quite resilient, the type the de the actual decimus is very fragile and you can break it. So you have to be very careful. You have to keep releasing aqueous counter pressure has to be minimized. and the other problem is post operatively the incidence of double anterior chamber even if you don't have a perforation in that scenario can be a little high so you have to be prepared for that as well but if you do a good manual dissection you can still get good outcomes but it may the recovery may take a little longer unlike mm -hmm. a big bubble dark where at one month your patient can see pretty well if you do a manual dissection with a near decimus dissection manual at one month they may be about 618 but for them to reach 6966 it may take 3 to 6 months and also it depends on what kind of graft you have put i have realized that previously when in that scenario we were putting in full thickness graft during surgery you will be able to oppose the graft and the host but when you remove the sutures you find the graft becomes a little elevated, elevated yeah. and if you see on the topography you will see a ring of steepening at the graft host junction with the relative central flattening that somehow induces Higher aberrations, and your patients are not able to see well. So I follow now what Massimo Busin does: is I always take a microkeratome with a 400 head. I prepare my anterior graft of 400 micron thickness, and I find that my opposition is much better, and the post-operative shape of the cornea also looks pretty good. Just, just one more question, sir. Uh, in macular dystrophy, especially at RP center, the patient profile that we get. you are scared of doing pkp full thickness graft but nowadays i think this is a general consensus in all macular dystrophy you should go ahead and do a pkp rather than dal so what should you take on you that you have a, it depends on the extent of involvement and the age of the patient if you have a patient who's 25 30 year old with macular dystrophy maybe and and it's not too dense i will still try to do a dal but if i have somebody over the age of 45 50 with a macular dystrophy i will do a triple pk because i have realized that in that such cases even if i successfully do a dalk the visual outcome is not optimal mm -hmm. because you will find that even the pre decimus layer will have the Some deposits and deposits. somehow when the patients come back and we know that macular dystrophy is also associated with poor endothelial cell count they have a lot mm -hmm. of gutted changes so instead of making it a double procedure i think doing a good penetrating mm -hmm. keratoplasty gives you reasonably good outcomes thank you sir thank, thank, you, thank sir. you so much and